What's up, Saints fans? Welcome into another edition of Inside Black and Gold. Steve Geller along with Jeff Nowak, and we are in NFL Combine Week. Obviously, plenty to talk to uh, talk about that. We got restructures going on. Jeff and I did an interview with ESPN NFL Draft Insider Matt Miller, and there's a whole bunch of news coming out from the Combine from Dennis Allen. We'll delve into as well. Jeff, how you doing, man? I'm doing good. Anyone watching this video can tell it's not my normal backdrop. I am sitting in a kitchen in Connecticut right now because I visit my family this week. That's why we didn't have an episode earlier in the week. But I wanted to get at least one done while I'm here. Um, but for obvious reasons, I am not up to speed on the combine per se. I was able to catch up a lot on what Dennis Allen and Jeff Ireland said. So we're going to talk a lot about that. Uh, first segment, I want to kind of talk about the non-combine stuff that that was all out. We're going to talk about some restructures. Second segment is going to be that interview with Matt Miller. We're going to talk a little about that. And then the final segment, I want to get into some of the actual combine stuff, mostly from Jeff Ireland on some of their scouting processes. But, but yeah, you know, I'm it, it's 30 degrees here, so I'm. Uh, uh, but it's warm inside. That's the biggest difference between Louisiana 30 and Connecticut 30 is they they understand how insulation works, <laughs> and so like when I'm inside, I'm comfy. It's nice. It's a nice step outside, and I'm like, yep, this is why I don't live here anymore. Yeah, I can't imagine, you know, dealing with the the 30 degrees. We had like a week or two of it here and I was over it. Yeah, we had there was some snow on the ground when I got here, but it was like oh, warm man. enough the other day that it rained and like cleared it all out. So now it's just everything dead. Like that's the other thing. You look out the window and it's just this long expanse of dead trees. Gray charcoal looking. They'll come back though. <laughs> I, I'm pretty confident they'll come back. Anyway, so <laughs> speaking of guys that are going to come back. Uh, yeah. Today... You know, so the last over the weekend, you know, we, we haven't recorded an episode since I think last Wednesday. So there have been a few things that came out since the last podcast. So we'll catch up on that. The first thing is the salary cap increased by significantly more than we anticipated. I think they were looking at uh, 200, 235 million or something in that range or two, oh, I'm sorry, 245 million. And it actually went up to 255 million. So that's a $30 million increase year over year. It's the largest year-to-year -year increase in NFL history. And it, it, effectively, it means that the Saints have about $10 million more in space to play with than they thought they would. So for this, for us, so for a lot of teams, it's like, oh, we have some extra money. We can throw at some free agents. For the Saints, who undergo this very tedious, planned-out process every year, it just makes that process that much easier. It's the inverse of what happened in 2021 when the cap actually went down by about 10 million. It actually, so wait, I think this is really, that's really what this is, is you're kind of just correcting for that season where it went down. And so, you know, when you're looking at the saints, they had about 83 million going in about 81 million, give or take, depending on where you look. And that number dropped to 71 million that you end up ultimately having to clear. They restructured Derek Carr. They restructured a handful of these contracts. The most recent ones are Nathan Shepard, which was smaller. It was like 2.7 million. Cesar Ruiz, which is in the range of 7 million. They also got Carl Granderson, which is around 7 million. And then the most recent was Cam Jordan, which came out this morning. There was some confusion initially from Adam Schefter's report where he said that they cleared about 1.7 million. And that was weird because it was like they could clear 9.3. So if they only cleared one point something, it would almost indicate a pay cut or something like that. But that was corrected later in the day. They did exercise that full $9.4 million restructure. So that leaves the Saints at about $16 million over the salary cap. And uh, with plenty of time, they have until I think March 13th to get there. And they have plenty of options in, in terms of how to get there. So it's really, really, you've reached the point now where it's just a question of, who do you want to restructure? I thought Cam Jordan was a was a no-brainer. A lot of people would say, hey, he's old. He wasn't productive this past season. And I get that. To me, I look at it as, okay, is this guy going to retire, be cut, or traded after the 2024 season? And I know the Saints are have no interest in trading him or cutting him, so I can eliminate that. And I know that he has said that he goes in two-year intervals with his with his decisions on whether to keep playing year 13 was the last one. That's the year we just got through the next will be year 15. So unless something changes drastically for him from a health perspective, he's fully intending on playing in 2025. So it just made the, the amount you can clear versus the fact that you're not going to have to deal with this next season in terms of retirement 
made that make a lot of sense. And if the option was like, hey, we can either restructure Cam or Alvin Kamara, I'm going with Cam. If we could either restructure Cam or Ryan Ramchick, I'm going with Cam. So I think that was that was a no-brainer. Now the next guys you're looking at, okay, do you restructure Tyron Matthew, Taysom Hill, Demario Davis? I think you have to hit two of those three. So it's just a question of who. Um, but they're going to get there very easily. And then it's just going to be from there. It's a question of how much space do you want to clear to sign free agents and whatnot. But we are well along this process and, it, and it's all kind of where we expected it to be. Yeah, just like the beginning of it all, you hear the pundits around the league yeah. criticizing the Saints, you know, and and we, you know, we're, we're at the point where, you know, you, like you said, 16 million now, they just have to clear uh, of their slash and dash with the salary cap. Uh, I, I guess we're just used to it by now where it doesn't really phase anybody in the local media. But man, oh man, uh, I, I, you mentioned Cam Jordan. I'm, I'm hoping last year was just a, a small blip and not really the we're seeing the end obviously of cam's run uh in the nfl just because i know he dealt with some you know injuries last season that really limited him and he played through it and i I know everyone talks about you don't want to hear excuses from guys but it definitely was not the same cam jordan so i'm hoping that the ankle issue is more of you know what the reason we saw that lack of production from him yeah i mean i think reality is somewhere in the middle Right. Of like, yes, he (laughs) has declined to some extent, but not nearly as much as it seemed last year. One of the issues, and I I think Dennis Allen said this, I I don't know where, I think he might've said this in the interview with uh, James White and, or Steve White and James Palmer is like, his issue isn't so much pressuring the quarterback. It's getting the guy to the ground, you know? And and that's been something that he's never been a lead at that. He's never been a 20 sack guy. But he's always been, you know, in that in that eight to fifteen range, right? In that yeah. in that middling range, and I think that's where you saw, in, especially on like third downs, where the guy's going to scramble around and try to, you know, extend plays. That's where he struggled, and I think the solution is take some of that off his plate, and that's what you did later in the year, and it worked. And I think Cam is still an elite rundowns player, and you're gonna and you need Definitely. to get elite rundowns action from him. And I hope that they can come up with a scenario that they take advantage of some younger, more uh, athletic pass rushers. And we'll see what they do with Zach Vaughn in free agency. We'll see what Isaiah Foskey maybe can do in year two if they draft another guy. I think they they're gonna look they're gonna look at pass rushers for sure in this draft. So I, I think that's kind of what it is: is you need to find a way to tease out what's left for Cam without getting too caught up in this idea that oh he's the he's the star he's the three down player and and you got to be able to bridge that gap and i think they will i think they've kind of gotten to that point and and the money is the money like it's it people want to get caught up in the contract the contract is what it is he's gonna be here so it's about maximizing what you can out of that money and that's why the restructure always felt like a no-brainer shifting gears here slightly well i do want to mention so that we do know the nflpa report card came out yesterday we're recording this thursday um, we're not going to get too deep into it today. I, you know, we can mention it, we can talk about it, but I do want to do a full episode on that because there's a lot to dive into and I haven't really gotten a chance to go through it all yet in terms of like, I've gone through a lot of the Saints stuff, but I haven't really looked around. I want, one of the things I like to do is, is go through everyone that got F's and figure out what exactly prompted an F because there are some teams with a lot of F's. Um, the funny thing about it in the Saints, the Saints were in the middle. The Saints ended up 19. They got eight B's. Um, you know, one a, but it was a category where everybody got A's, you know, the strength coaches, it's kind of interesting. And when you look at the grades, you need to look at not just what the grades are, but also where they land among NFL teams, right? So you were, you got an A minus in strength coaches, but you ranked 14th, whereas you got a B plus in like think training room or something like that. And that was fourth. So it's like, it's not only just what the letter grade is, but that's what media wants to wants to hinge on so they can have these hot takes like oh man the saints you know the funny thing is they got an f and i'm sure this is what this is probably annoying to the saints because they got an f in cafeteria <laughs> and <laughs> what is their big project of the off season what is prompting the training camp hey they realize so, the issue right yeah so they're fixing it but that right. doesn't mean but they're still going to get all these all this grief for getting an f you know so these these surveys went out november to to august or uh august to november so right. a lot of it, some some of it's training camp, some of it's early season, some of it's mid season. Anyway, 
The one it's that's not like real quick was a B minus for Dennis Allen. Wow, that's 29th. Well, right. And I and I think it is it is interesting. And the, the real interesting part is how how predictive some of these grades were on the coaching side because there were only three teams that got a grade of C or worse for their coaches. One was the Raiders, one was the Falcons, and the other was the Commanders. You know what those three teams have in common? They fired the coaches. You know? <laughs> and there was 10 teams that got a B minus or worse. Two of those teams were, I'm sorry, a B or worse. Two of those teams were the Chargers and the Patriots. So those two teams got fired. The others were the Browns, Saints, Bucks, Jets, and Bears. And I think you could look at all of those teams, maybe with the exception of the of the Bucks and say, and the Browns, and say a lot of these teams are on thin or, or like a lot of these coaches are just on various stages of thin ice. And the only reason you don't say that about the Browns and the Bucks is because they made the playoffs, but both of those teams still kind of underperformed. The Browns, you lost your quarterback, whatever. The the Bucks, you didn't have. You, you went with Baker Mayfield, so that kind of – anyway. So it's well, all like there. You mentioned when, when this survey was taken early on, you could say the Bucks head coach was on the hot seat. Yeah, when, and again, like we don't know how, when these surveys came in. Is it training camp? Who is like, – how? what's the frequency of surveys across teams? It's going to vary. But there were like 1,700 responses. So if you average that out over 32 teams, that's about 53 players per team. So that would indicate that – you know, it's 90 man roster. So you're getting about halfway. Anyway, it's it's a whole thing. We're going to go through all this on Monday. Right. So I don't want to get too into it, but it is interesting. Every year it's interesting. The Saints did okay. They didn't do great. They didn't do bad. They did okay. They were in the middle. And, and that's I fine. will say one last thing about it. I don't know if you saw uh, TJ Watt tweeted about the NFLPA rankings. And he's like, kind of with the Pro Bowl stuff, you throw it out or you give it to a rookie to fill out. But between picking team captains, and then also the NFLPA survey, the players do take it seriously. No, no, I think they do. I think they do. And this year there was about 400 more responses than the year before. It's the second okay. year they've done it. So, and, and again, like the thing that I think, and I want to get into this again, but it's supposed to be a roadmap for players who are entering free agency for the first time and they're trying to figure out where they want to go play. And it gives yeah. them an indication of what this team does well, what the, some of the pitfalls are, you know, and like that's what it's meant for. It's not meant for media analysis to be like, oh, they suck and like their cafeteria sucks. Oh, no. You know, so it, but that's what it ends up being. And that's but what that's kind of funny to me because Chiefs ownership got an F, but yeah. they're, I still want to go play there. <laughs> well, I've been listening to, you know, I'm in Connecticut. So I'm hearing a lot of uh, WEI, like the Boston stations. I drive around with my dad in okay. the car. They're like, oh, man, Robert Kraft got a terrible grade. I mean, it's just funny. Um, but either way. Uh, are they, they, these guys need big planes. What's going on? Anyway, uh, it's <laughs> but anyway. So let's let's get off that. Um, I do want to talk a bit about so a couple of things Dennis Allen said. He talked about James Winston, Marshawn Lattimore, Mike Thomas, Ryan Ramchuk, right? And the to me, so the first one is Ryan Ramchuk, and I'm not going to play that clip because it's 13 seconds long. But basically, what Dennis Allen right. said is the team feels a lot better about where he is at right now than they did a month, a month and a half ago. He had a minor procedure on his knee to kind of clean it out. That's, that's you know, these guys have these procedures. You know, these are you know, just, you know, run-of-the-mill procedures. A lot, of, a lot of players have these procedures. You'd never hear about them. Um, but you're just kind of cleaning out scar tissue, getting in a situation where anything that might have been bugging him that you can fix, you fixed. And so that's where he is. And, and to me, that's positive because he didn't have to give that kind of ringing endorsement. He could have said, yeah, we're still kind of in wait and see mode, whatever. So to me, that's a very positive thing because you're going, especially you're at the combine, you're trying to figure out what are your musts, what are your wants. And if you can go into next season with a with a scenario that's like, we don't know what the long-term prognosis is for, Al, for Ryan Ramchek in terms of how many years he can play and whether you're going to get the full value of that contract. But if you can go into next season confident that you'll at least get starting caliber Ryan Ramchek for 2024, then that makes things a lot easier to figure out. Yeah, I mean that's it's a it's going to be difficult with this team between Ramchek and you got a guy where I'm, I know we'll get into two with Trevor Penning. I still feel like that tackle position you got to address it. Oh yeah, you got you you got to you got to look at it. You got to bring in bodies, but at the same time, if I I feel a lot better if I know that my star right tackle is still my star right tackle. And I'm not right. and I'm you can still draft a guy in the first round and say he's going to be your future right tackle, but. I'm just saying, like, just from the, the pieces on the board, you know, you got a chessboard and where are you putting the pieces? And I feel better about where the pieces are if Ryan Ramchek is one of those pieces. 
Um, just the the stories about what he's dealing with in that knee definitely worry me though. When you hear, yeah. you know, he's missing cartilage. Any degenerative type knee stuff. Yes, for, exactly. For a guy who has to you know, anchor on those legs. Yeah, so not... expect those veteran days of rest to continue this. this oh yeah, 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 yeah. You're still gonna manage it in the same. Like you're still gonna be yeah. managing it. It's not like it's gone. But I think the team just feels a little more comfortable that he will be available. So that's one thing. You talked about Mike Thomas too. We didn't really get much. We don't need to get into that. <laughs> I don't think Di really knows what's going on with Mike. Does um, anyone? Yeah, I, 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 that's a good question. You know, he, Di got asked if he if he had had surgery, and Di was like, "I'm not sure." You know? <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, I'm not surprised that that the team is not fully up to speed on what's going on with Mike's Mike's rehab, and Da might not be, but like. It'd have been funny if he was like, I don't know. It's not my problem anymore. <laughs> it's, I mean, that's kind of how I kind of read it. Of like, yes. <laughs> Because he, he was asked about Marshawn, and that's the next one I got into, because like, he had answers about Marshawn, and he was asked about injuries for Marshawn. Anyway, let, let's just let's listen to what he had to say about Marshawn, because I think there were some interesting things in that, uh, too. Let's see. What can you say about where you guys stand with Marshawn Lattimore? I, I know his contract got tinkered with. I mean, yeah, there look. been talks with him about... Yeah, look, Staying together, look, possible trade. Lattimore's on our football team. He's a good football player. He's been a good football player for us. And so, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of things that happen, you know, throughout the offseason. But, um, but you know, Lat's a, Lat's a big part of our team right now. You mentioned earlier Marshawn and right now. Just as a coach, what is that process like of figuring out who's on the roster? And specifically with him, like if you guys do decide to move on or trade, like that, that's a really big decision what kind of goes into that if, however whatever you end up yeah i mean I, I think really it's about you know um i think it's about guys um, that we feel like can help us you know win football games guys that we feel like can uh, continue to build the right type of um, culture here um, and guys that are you know willing to do the things that are it's necessary to do to uh, to succeed and so um, look, like I said, I mean, Marshawn's part of our football team. He's been a big part of our football team. Um, unfortunately, the last couple of years, health has been a, uh, a big factor in that. And so um, I think the biggest thing is, is, you know, let's get Marshawn healthy and let's see where we're at as a football team. And, um, you know, we'll get the right guys out there that give us a chance to, to win. Does health feel like a future concern for him at all? I mean, I know they were you know, really I, unique I, Yeah, I... I don't know that those are, are necessarily predictors of, you know, future, you know, injury issues. And yet, look, I think anytime you, you have um, some injuries, those, those all, you know, factor into the, any type of decisions that you, that you make. But um, like I said, I, I, look, he's a good football player. He's made a lot of football plays for us. I've been with him for a long time. And, and uh, you know, I think he is a guy that can help us win. So there's a few things that stand out there. Um, the first is right now. <laughs> I, you didn't have to say right now. <laughs> he chose to say right now. Um, and so like that you're going to, you know, it's like, these are, this is the time of year where we listen to something and we listen to it again and we read into it and we read into it again. And then we read into it a third time. And, but when you say someone is a big part of your team right now, the obvious inference there <laughs> is that that is a temporary situation and right, so that could change <laughs> whether whether that's he's intending that to be how it sounds that's how it sounds to me and i do think that's reality is you're you're going to shop marshawn now that doesn't mean you're going to trade marshawn but i think 100 percent you're going to figure out whether there's a market and what the market is and if there's a trade on the table that makes sense i think you're going to make it if there's not you are perfectly fine bringing marshawn back and having your all pro star cornerback still on your roster um, but that's just going to be a question. But either way, I, I do agree with the 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 rest of it in the sense that like, okay, yeah, he's had these injuries year after year, these last two years. But I don't think you look at it and say it's he's an injury prone guy because right. you lacerate your spleen. Freak that's accident. Not, I mean, that's a freak injury. The the high ankle sprain that can happen to anybody you got rolled yeah. up on. It's just what happened. So I agree with that. And I think that that's kind of, you know, when you're a coach, that's important to say, because it's like, I don't think teams are going to look at that and be like, oh, we can't, we can't, we can't trust him. He's gotten hurt. Guys get hurt. It's the NFL. Um, but I think, I think you're getting an honest answer from DA there, whether he intended to be that honest or not. 
in that, yeah, this team would love to have Marshawn. But I think there's also the reality of the situation where maybe you don't and you have to figure that out. The the thing that troubles me with the talk of trading Lattimore is the fact that for it to be conducive for salary cap, it can't happen till after the draft. And that doesn't make sense to me at all. Yeah. I mean, that's the other question is if you do trade him, when do you trade him? You know, and, and it's not, you know, it's, it's not going to kill you from the cap perspective if you trade him prior to June 1st, but it's not going to make life easier on you either. So that's yeah, just the question. To me though, too, you think about that. What's Dennis Allen going to do to set up a could be future coach with draft picks for a guy that you could use on the team right now. I, I don't know. It just, it's all the situation's odd to me. I also don't think it's necessarily like Dennis Allen making these decisions either. No, like he's not, right. he's not in charge of player personnel, right? Like yeah. to an extent, like he's, he has say in the, in the, in the matter, but he's not calling teams saying, what are you going to give us for Marshawn? You know? So I think there's a reality where, you know, maybe Marshawn gets traded, but like, he's not sitting there saying we're trading, you know, you get what I'm saying? Like, it's not necessarily yeah. something that's happening in his in his immediate vicinity. You know, he's not the one calling other GMs and engaging the market and doing all that. So, I just yeah. hope it's a situation too where it's not where we you know that all the Marshawn Lattimore talk trade talk popped up is the fact that he's unhappy here now and wants to move on. I, I hope that's not the case. It's tough to know. I mean, right. that's the that's the it's like okay, Mike Thomas goes a little nuts on social media, but the the react the the result of that is we know where he stands. Yes, I we haven't heard from Marshawn. I mean, even <laughs> during the season when he was healthy, right. he didn't talk. I don't think we've had an interview with Marshawn since training camp. So you don't really know where he stands because he, he hasn't you told. Know, us. I can't even remember getting him in camp that which is crazy. I'm sure we, we did. Got him but, in camp. We got okay. him in camp once, I think. And then that it. was yeah, right. I think that's the only time he talked all year was like early in camp and we would ask him and he's not into it, you know, and, and then he got hurt. So I, I think there was this like, I'll talk next week. I'll talk next week. And then he got hurt and then it was never. Yeah. So, Cause that happened in week 10. It's not like it happened in week 15. So it's like, you know, halfway through the season, he's not there anymore and you don't interview players that are hurt. So, you know, that's, it's not, but yeah. So we, it's just tough. I, I don't think there's a lot of information, um, to tell you where he stands or how he how he is uh, feeling about the situation. Yeah, come on, Marshawn. You got to start taking after uh, Mike T and tweet. Start tweeting some stuff so we know it's up. <laughs> I don't think that's the solution. <laughs> no, it's definitely not Marshawn. Unless he really wants to be traded, then that's a good way to make sure you get traded. Is to start doing <laughs> stuff like that. Um, one last clip that I'll play from Da, and I just thought it was interesting. Is uh, Da talking about Jameis? Because uh, <laughs> it, it, here you go. I know obviously a lot was made about Jameis at the end of the season, but are you able to share a little bit about kind of where things stand with him going into the offseason? Yeah, look, um, yeah, I think I think I think Jameis is still under contract as we sit here right now, and and uh, there's a lot of things that happen throughout the you know offseason program. We'll see see how those things uh, you know play out. But as we sit and look, I know Jameis has said I want to go and be a starter, you know, and and. Uh, you know, obviously, that's that's something that that he aspires to do, and um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll see how things play out. I do, I did appreciate that because it's like he wants to go be a starter, and that ain't happening here. <laughs> Basically, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, that that's he, another situation that's just awkward right now. And he's referencing the interview that Jameis did with Kyle Mosley at the at the Legacy Bowl, right? So it's yes. it's funny because like, and we we knew this. This isn't new. He talked last year about how he still thinks he can be a starter in the NFL. Sure, but like that's the thing. He chose to come back and be a backup on the Saints. Now I don't know if that was a product of not having an opportunity. No one was going to give him a chance to start. But who knows? You got another off season. You got a chance to go around and talk to teams. And even if he and the, and the thing is like, I think there's a scenario for Jameis where. He signs on to be a backup somewhere because there will be an opportunity to to step into a starting role, and there's good that that's different from a scenario like New Orleans where you're going to sign on to be the backup, and that is ironclad. You are not going to exactly. be the starter. Uh, even if James, even if if he came back and Derek went down, I still don't. I don't know if you'd go like that's that's because I think James likes it here. And I think he'd like to stay if he could. But if he wants to be a starter, he's probably going to have to go somewhere else. 
Even yeah, if I think it's pretty clear that the locker room likes him too, because everybody was all yeah. supportive of let's get Jamal Williams that touchdown. Yeah, it wasn't no, like, wait a minute, we got to well listen liked, to coach. He's well liked in the locker room. He's well liked in the city. He's a very popular player. So we'll see. But I, I don't think the Saints are gonna are gonna be uh, tripping over themselves to bring him back when the lasting image of Jameis is him openly defying the head coach in the final play of the season. That's that to me was the nail in the coffin for sure. But like Allen just said in that clip, man, he he technically he's under contract right now. Yeah, well, they're gonna have to do something with him, right? So it's gonna have to the you know the the something's gonna have to happen <laughs> one way or the other. Um, a few other things, and you know we don't need to play the clip. Uh, Da confirmed that the training camp's gonna be out in California. No, well he he didn't confirm that's gonna be in California, but he did confirm that it is gonna be Somewhere outside else. of the area. Right. I think there's still probably some T's to cross, whatever, but. Irvine is the place and you know what he said. And then I think this is the same reason that Sean Payton really liked to take the team on holiday is, you know, it's just a bonding experience, right? Like it's the same reason, like when, yeah. when they would go out West and they would stay, you know, I think a good example is when they played the Rams in 2019, uh, that the game breeze got hurt and they stayed out West and practiced out West because they had the follow up game against the Seahawks the next week. And I think like like there's a reason that Sean liked to do stuff like that. And it's because you just build a camaraderie, you hole up in a hotel and you do, you know, nothing but football. That's what you're there to do. It's your life. Um, and that's what it's supposed to be here, but there's, there's a lot more distractions. So as much as they like being out there with the fans and, and uh, getting that experience and allowing the fans to interact with the team, I, I don't think that they're, I think they're excited about what's going to, what's going to happen in this training camp. Yeah, and it just so happens to coincide with them wanting to do some renovations around the building. Uh, I'm sure there is going to be maybe two, three practices eventually that the fans, you know, when they'll come back home, fans will be able to come out. I'm, you know, it's not positive, but I would guess they would do something. I'm sure they'll do something for fan engagement, yeah. whatever it is. I'm not sure what it'll be, but it's interesting. And and you know, hey man, and then when they come back, they'll have this swanky new cafeteria, so maybe they'll get a better grade next year. There you go. Right. Exactly. It should be when I saw that we go real quick with the grades. Anytime with food and New Orleans, we should never yeah. be an F. Well, it, well, and the quality of the food is the other thing. Like, I don't know how renovating the cafeteria will improve the quality of the food, but that's the second year in a row that they have gotten significant criticism on the quality of the food at the facility. And, you know, I don't I don't know. I've never had it. So I can't tell you if it's good or not. Well, I, well, I don't I know. Here comes a dig. I sure hope that the facility chef is not the same chef for the dome. I hope it's better than than this press box food. Let's put yes, that exactly. Uh, but you know, and then there's a few other things you talked about. Clint Kubiak talked about you know accountability stuff like that. That's stuff we can get into as we get further into the off season, particularly training camp. So we'll we'll cut it off there. Um, but this is inside black and gold. I'm Jeff Nowak, dispatched in Connecticut. Uh, he is Steve Geller. You can follow me on Twitter at Jeff underscore Nowak. You can follow him at Steve Geller WBL. As you can tell from watching the video, neither of us is at the combine, <laughs> so we'll have to rely on what they tell us and one person who we talked to this week or last week i should say is matt miller from espn he gave us some insight into a lot of these uh, prospects what he's looking at some strength of this draft so we're going to come back we're going to we're going to listen to that interview and we're going to talk about it a bit who dat this is inside black and gold stick around And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He is Steve Geller. We're going to bring in mystery guest number three, and that is Matt Miller. He's an NFL Draft insider for ESPN. He was previously with Bleacher Report. You know, it's funny. I actually, I used to work for Bleacher Report as a copy editor back in like the early 2010s, or I guess not the early 2010s, like 2013, 2014. And uh, I was, I, I had, had edited several of Matt Miller's articles and he was pretty good then. And I remember at the time, because that was like, of, that was a previous life of Bleacher Report where you had some high quality stuff and then you had some really sketchy stuff just filtering in from people who probably shouldn't be writing, you know? And, 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 and so if you, it was, it would stand out whenever I'd get one of his articles. Cause I was like, no, this guy's legit. <laughs> uh, and then, then it was not, so it's not a surprise to me that he's moved on to ESPN. He's, he's a very well-respected draft analyst. So it was good to catch up with him, but without further ado, let's play that clip. Obviously we are knee deep in mock draft season and looking at yours at pick number 14 with the Saints. Uh, you've got them taking tight end Brock Bowers, which would be an awesome upgrade at the tight end position. Uh, just what have you seen out of the Georgia prospect heading into the combine? 
Oh my gosh, he's he's close to perfect as a tight end prospect. And I'll say this: I mean, he is a top ten player in this draft, but because of positional value is available at this spot for the Saints. And I I did look at this as a best player available type pick uh, with the quarterbacks off the board. So that's a, a big part of that equation. But Bowers is a, a player I've compared him to George Kittle. I think that's the type of weapon you're getting offensively. Uh, maybe not as accomplished as a blocker as Kittle is right now, but certainly has the ability to get better. He's strong, but I mean, as a pass catcher, he's so versatile. And even at times for Georgia, he's running the ball to the backfield. I mean, he's just such a, a dynamic asset in the, in the offense. So he is someone that, you know, with changes offensively, I think there's going to be a need for that number two option in the passing game. And, and for me, Bowers can be that guy. I think that's an interesting point is like the position of value because, you know, as you mentioned, so there's all these star tight ends in the NFL, but you look around, you're like Mark Andrews, Travis Kelsey, George Kittle. None of these guys were first round picks. So I guess how do you yeah. kind of weigh that when you have it's like, okay, this is a generational type tight end prospect, but at the same time, the value might not be there. And you look at it kind of similar to running backs where it's like, yeah, Saquon Barkley has been a star, but has he been good enough to justify taking him number two overall, right? Kyle Pitts, for example, with the yeah. Falcons. I'm just curious, say, how do you kind of evaluate that when you look at a guy like Brock? I think the nice thing about Brock, as opposed to someone, you know, like, and I know Saints fans know Kyle Pitts. Well, you play him twice a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Brock is able to play in line. He's able to block. He's able to help in the run game. Whereas, you know, Kyle Pitts is a, he's a big wide receiver, basically. And that's not a knock on him. There's a, there's value in that. And you look at his rookie year and there's value in that. I think the difference is Kyle Pitts is a player you have to scheme for. Brock Bowers is not. He, to me, is more in the mold of someone like Sam Laporta, uh, who was, you know, picked 34 last year, goes to the Lions, mm-hmm. has a huge impact. Uh, he's, you know, someone a little bit more like TJ Hawkinson or in that Kittle mold of they're going to be on the field every down. And by virtue of their ability, you can move them around, but you don't have to put them in the slot. You don't have to get them in motion. They're a tight end that you can run your offense through. I don't want to compare anyone to Travis Kelsey because I think he's in kind of a tier by himself, what he's done the last 11, 12 years, but it's that idea. And I think that's why even last year, we saw so many tight ends drafted in the first hundred picks. We saw eight of them or nine, maybe in the first hundred last year. Uh, because teams are saying now, well, we can run our offense through the middle of the field, you know, with timing based offense, with option routes, we've got quarterbacks who can move now. So I, I think Bowers does fit that that mold of we're rethinking the tight end position to where it it is still valuable. I think, you know, you can look at you can look at what they're being paid. Tight ends are not as valuable as wide receivers based on how they're being paid. But, you know, we saw four teams in the championship conference championship games who you could make an argument their tight end is one of their most important assets in the passing game protecting Derek Carr obviously a big issue last season and something the Saints are going to need to upgrade either through the draft or free agency and I know this tackle class is chock full of some stud talent maybe the one of the best position groups in this year's draft do you see something that could shake out for the Saints in this draft in the early rounds where they could end up picking someone there yeah, definitely. I think, you know, they gave up 35 sacks last year. So it's got to give, you know, and unfortunately the Trevor Penning pick has not panned right. out uh, the way, you know, that you spent a first round pick on a guy, you're hoping he's a, a foundational piece. So I think so. Yes. Um, long story short, what's interesting about this tackle class is there are two guys and they're going to go really early. Joe Alt and Olu Fashano. They're going to go top seven picks probably. After that, there's a lot of good tackles, but they're all right tackles. And obviously, Ryan Remchek's a pretty dang good right tackle. So you get into this conversation of, can we move a guy over? Can we move uh, Talise Fuaga from Oregon State, can, who's a great right tackle? Can he flip sides? Or Amarius Mims from Georgia, who only started eight games in college, but I would say those eight games are as good a tape as any tackle in this class. Can he move? Could Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma make the move to left tackle? We saw him do that a little bit at the Senior Bowl. So because I think the need is more, I would argue, more specific to that left side, you start to look at the first round and say, you know, would we be better with a Brock Bowers? Would we be better with a, if one of the wide receivers falls? And then we get into you know, later rounds looking at where's their good value with the left tackles. Someone like Patrick Paul from Houston, I think is a really good option. He could be there at 45. Someone who had, you know, six foot seven, really good mover. So not that first round pick, which we all want left tackles to be first round picks because you find such great uh, players in that range. But I think round two this year is a spot where having that 45th pick is going to be really important that maybe you're finding your left tackle a little bit later. You know, those first round grades, I know you wrote about this recently where I think you said that you had 15 players or so with 
with first round grades. And I think it is interesting because when you draft where the Saints are, you're at number 14. So it's like if you have 15 players with first round grades, you can guarantee you get one of those players. Yeah. But is it one of the players at a position of need? And and I think that's where you you run into this ideology of like every team will probably say, hey, we're going to take the best player available. But a lot of time it's, hey, we'll take the best player available at a position we need. Right. You're not right. necessarily right. fully in that in that mode. So I guess when you when you are looking at the board at number 14, do you have to be willing to just kind of let it come to you and 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 go by your board or how do you, how do you look at that from a philosophical standpoint? I'm a big believer in best player available at a position of need. You know, I don't, okay. if the best player available is a fullback, you don't, you're not drafting, right? <laughs> and it's like, you might have a, you might have a perfect grade on a guard. I'm, I'm one of like, drafting a guard in the first round. It's hard for me just because of the positional value, you know, and, and the numbers say you can find a pretty good guard outside the first round. So I think you have to look at those core positions, quarterback, wide receiver, left tackle on offense, pass rusher or a corner on defense is really where we're going to see a lot of the first round picks go. And I, I think for the saints at 14, we're probably going to see four quarterbacks off the board. We're probably going to see three wide receivers off the board. And I think there's a good chance we're going to see three offensive tackles off the board. So like you're eliminating a lot of those premium positions, but the good news is, you know, the, one of the top corners could be there. One of the top pass rushers could be there. And if, even if you're not in a position to take one of them, it is going to give you a lot of good trade back opportunities. So, you know, I wouldn't advocate for some of the massive round one trades we've seen the saints do in the past, but you know, maybe you kick back three or four spots and get a little extra draft capital and then you're more in the neighborhood of where you want to be for uh, one of those tackles that you're going to have to move. Or, you know, maybe maybe the first guard comes off the board in the 20s. I think that's a more comfortable spot than 14 when you add in the, the extra draft capital that you would get from the trade back. Checking out the Saints pick in your uh, the second round of your mock draft. Really like the pick. Jeff, you got to see Xavier Leggett out at the Senior Bowl. Uh, seems like a perfect replacement for a guy like Michael Thomas, who I don't think anyone is expecting back with the black and gold. Yeah, and powerful. Kind of like Thomas in that mold of like he's just going to physically overpower you to get to the ball. Uh, didn't run as well in person as I expected. Um, I was a little surprised by that. But he does on tape show run after catch ability. And he has speed. You know, there are moves on his tape where he is, you know, putting a shoulder on a guy and then breaking away for a long run. So that ability there, when you have a Chris Olave, you can go with, I think, a more physical option opposite him, somebody that is going to be your – you know, a little bit of your power forward type wide receiver. And that's what that's who Leggett is. So again, trying to build out this team with that has a, a decent amount of needs and perpetual salary cap problems. I really went into this thinking like, how can you turn something into a strength? You got an offense that was productive last year. It was the number nine ranked offense in the NFL last year based on points. So how can you turn something into a strength? Showing up the offensive line definitely is is in mind, but getting Bowers and Leggett, getting big body pass catchers that have run after catchability could really open things up. Sharp pivot here, but this is something I've been wondering about because, you know, I think it, when you're a team that's looking for kind of a, a nickel corner prospect in the draft, I think there's a disconnect between at times, okay, you played a ton in the slot in college versus you profile to the slot at the NFL level. Like a guy like Mike Sanders still, he played a ton of the slot in college. Yeah. But a lot of times it's like, yeah, you're the best, you're the NFL prospect. You're going to be put in the most premium position, which isn't always in the slot. So I'm curious if there are any either safety cornerback prospects that you love in terms of transitioning to being a slot corner in the NFL as you kind of go through maybe the first three rounds of, of this draft? Yeah, I say Andrew Stills definitely one of them. Uh, Andrew Phillips at Kentucky is another one that I think fits that mold. And he'll probably be like a early third round pick, but he had a great senior bowl week. I mean, his, his instincts, his closing ability, like they scream inside player to me, but he's tough enough to play inside. Uh, 5'10", 190 pounds is, is the reason that he's probably looked at as an inside guy as opposed to an outside because all the skill sets there. So he definitely fits that mold. Uh, Jeremy Jones, Florida State, a little bit of a not late round, but later, probably around five. Uh, another guy that I think fits that mold of just going to be a really, really good nickel for a long time. And mm. there's so much value in that that uh, that he definitely fits that that group as well. ESPN's Matt Miller, thank you again. Definitely looking forward to more of your stuff coming out with the uh, NFL Combine cranking up. You bet, guys. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks again to Matt Miller for coming on. And, uh, you know, well, we can go back right to the beginning of that interview. You asked him about this. He put out a mock draft in the at the number 14 overall pick. He had the Saints landing Brock Bowers. And, mm. you know, you can talk all you want about positional value. And we did, you know, we, we did talk about positional value. 
Uh, but I, you know, it's like, he's like, oh man, I really want to left tackle, man. I really want edge rusher. <laughs> I would, I, I would be very much fine with the saints being like, give me Brock. Um, and, and you, you look at it and you say, okay, why, why is, is a tight end that valuable at the NFL level where you take them in the first round, particularly top mm-hmm. half of the first round and conventional wisdom would say no. And recent history would say no. Because even the guys you talk about, like the Travis Kelseys, the Mark Andrews, right? The Sam Laportas, these guys weren't first-round picks. Right. But I do think Brock is that good. And I do think this offense, one of the keys to this offense is unlocking the middle of the field. And I don't think you've been able to do it as well as you want to. I still like Juwan Johnson. I think he's still going to be, even if you draft Brock, he's still going to be a major piece of this offense. But I think Brock is just a bit more versatile from a, as a Y tight end, as an inline tight end, that you you're not tipping your hand as much when you put him on the field, and and I just I, I would love that pick personally if he got there. Yeah, and uh, we talked about it a little about obviously no one's expecting Michael Thomas back. A big physical target uh, for Derek Carr could only help this offense for sure. And then you mentioned with Juwan, uh, I know the Saints like him. Obviously, he just got you know paid, but uh, add a little spark under him to maybe even, you know, boost what he's doing even more because it's like, all right, we got this guy coming in. I got to show myself again. Yeah. And I mean, the thing with Juwan is you're asking yourself, okay, is he a valuable player? Is he, is he a competent NFL tight end that you can run out there and have success with? And I think the answer is yes, but what is his ceiling? And I think yeah. if you're, if you're looking at this and you're saying, okay, we, we really want an elite top end tight end option to help unlock this offense and to give Derek Carr uh, a safety valve and just a, a weapon in the middle of the field. I just think that's such a significant upgrade. And it's no offense to Jawan. I love Jawan. But, you know, like I think you, 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 you went UDFA shopping, right? And, and you found a guy who is much better than you probably ever would have thought coming out of college at what he's doing. He converted from wide receiver to tight end. He's done a great job and he's still good. And he's going to be a piece of this offense, whether you have Brock or not. But I, I don't think that his existence on the roster would make you say, yeah, we already we're set at tight end. We don't, we don't need a tight end when you have the elite option on the board. And you know, the other thing we talked about, it's like you're drafting at 14. So you don't necessarily have the luxury of being able to say, well, this is who we want, right? Mm-hmm. You have all, you have first round grades, and it depends how many you have. But you get to fourteen, and it's not a question of whether you which of the first round grades you want. It's which of the first round grades is still on the board, you right. know. And so, I, I don't think Brock's going to get there. So it might not even be a conversation they have to have when they get to on the clock at fourteen. But I I think that you know positional value, need versus want, you know. You're going to take the best player available, but are you always taking the best player available if it's at a position you don't need? I don't know, but I'm okay with that. The other pick was Xavier Leggett, the wide receiver out of South Carolina. He's a guy we talked about uh, when I came back from the Senior Bowl. Like I really, I really appreciated what he was able to do out there. Just a big physical guy. Not, I don't think as polished as a Mike Thomas when he came out of Ohio State, but they can do a lot of the same things. And so if you're trying to find a way to replace him in the offense, another second round pick, wouldn't be a terrible spot to try to do that. And that's not necessarily to say it has to be uh, Leggett, but I don't hate the idea of, you know, finding a new weapon, new big physical, big bodied weapon. So I like both those picks. I think, I think he's on the right track. I think you are going to spend some, some draft capital on offense this year. It was interesting though. They, uh, the two picks were on offense uh, from Miller, but not on the offensive line. It was just adding more weapons for Derek Carr. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that's going to be a really difficult uh, hurdle to get over. If you're, you know, you're looking at an Olu Fashanu or, or like a Fuanga drops, right. And you're just like, Oh, <laughs> but I really want Brock though. And, and you're going to have like the tight ends coat. You're going to Clancy's being like, guys, guys, you see this guy, you watch some Georgia it. games over the last few years, right? You, you don't think, <laughs> you don't think it's the guy we should have? We should, we should, we should have? And, uh, and, and then, you know, the offensive, you know, and then John Benton's going to be like, get out of here. <laughs> yeah, poor Clancy's like, with last year's tight end class, we got nobody. It is going to be interesting, though, because you do have a new offensive staff. So who's going to be the loudest? Yeah. You know, right. who's going to have the most conviction? And it's not only the position coaches, right? There's this whole scouting element involved here. And they're going to have their, their, their grades and their reports. And... You know, but at the end of the day, 
the position coaches have to have some input and some feedback. Um, and like, that's why you'll see in the, in the war room, you'll see like, Oh, they pick a cornerback out of Tennessee and the defensive, the D backs coach is like, yes, oh, you know, oh, oh. got him. <laughs> uh, and then the other guy's like, son of a bitch. Uh, anyway, but so we'll see, but I, I thought that was a lot of great insight from Matt. You know, he gave us some insight into the nickel corners. I think that's going to be an interesting market. I don't know if that's something you look at first two rounds, but like, for example, CJ Gardner Johnson was a fourth round pick. You can find high quality nickel cornerback prospects in the third, fourth, fifth round. So, like those are some guys that I think uh, you want to look at, um, whether they handle in free agency or not. But uh, yeah, that's it. Anything else from you? Uh, no, just the fact that uh, you know mock draft season obviously in full swing, and man, oh man, there's been so many different uh, outcomes for the Saints I've seen at number fourteen. It's it's pretty wild right now, from offensive lineman, tight end, uh, defensive end. Uh, it's all over the place. No, there's a whole, there's so many different paths they can take. And, and that's a good thing because at 14, like what we talked about, you don't get to pick your path. The path arrives and Come you take you, it. Right. <laughs> right. So the fact that there's, you know, like I think this is a deep enough draft where sitting at 14, you don't feel like you have to make a move, but you can if you, if you really love a guy. But I just like, if you do that, you better be right. This, you, you better not be guessing at all if you're going to make a move up the board knowing what we know and knowing about the, the assets they have and the misses they've had in the first round over the last few years um and so like and i think this is a big draft i really do like i think you know you don't need a 2017 but you got to get something you know you need multiple contributors out of this draft however that shapes up you need to be able to add young uh affordable talent on the first two days of the draft. You only have two picks right now because you don't have a third rounder. So I will say with the with the lack of success with those early round picks that this team has had, unfortunately, of late, uh, I was pr- surprised to see that the uh, Justin Matthews, their pro scout, the national scout, Mike Ball, and the area scout, Casey Talley, and Ireland were won the Inside the League Scouting Awards. It's like, how did that happen? No, they scout well. It's not it, it like we get we get really caught up in the in the first round grades. And yeah. I don't know if the scout, you know, the 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 true value of the scouts isn't, you know, you know a lot about the first round guys. Like it's those are the guys you are overloaded with information about. But what about the Rashid Shaheeds, right? What about, you know, Marcus Colston, right? Guys like that, guys that show up. Jawan Johnson, right? Guys that you didn't expect to get a ton of value out of, and you are Carl Granderson, right? That like those that's where scouts really make their money. The top end evaluators are not always the same. Like the area scouts, guys who find Caden Ellis, right? Um, so that's that's where you win your that's where you, that's where you make your money as a scout. Now the selection process, I think, in terms of these top end grades, comes down to these interviews, and and I think that's where you get a lot of insight into these younger guys or these uh, top end guys, but. But no, it, it is funny because you, you're going to see a lot of grief levied at the at the scouts because because of a guy like Trevor Penning, because of a guy like Peyton Turner, Marcus Davenport. But when you look at the overall picture, you found a lot of you know you, you got Alvin Kamara in the third round, you got Michael Thomas in the second round, like you get you got Marcus Williams in the third round, right? You got Teron Armstead. Like there's a lot of really really effective scouting going on, and it goes back a long time. Um, but yeah, it, it would be, it would be helpful if you if you didn't uh, miss in the first round. Yeah. The, with the picks of an early defensive end or offensive lineman, it kind of gives, I know a lot of saints fans, PTSD kind of thing, considering what, what what's happened in the past. Yeah. And speaking of that, I do want to play the Trevor Penning clip from Dennis Allen, just to kind of bridge off of what Matt said. Um, because I do think that it's uh, this, this, it, this answer was interesting. Let's listen. Yeah. How important this offseason is for Penning, just considering it's his first offseason where he really gets to work on technique. And- yeah, look, I think it's huge. Um, I mean, I think, look, here's the good news. The good news is is that, you know, he, he's coming in with a clean slate. Uh, he's coming in healthy. So he's going to have a, an opportunity to go through a full offseason program, both from a lifting perspective and from a practice perspective. And I think those are two critical things when you're talking about you know, still a, a young guy. I know this is going into his third year, but he missed basically his whole rookie season. Uh, and then last year, um, you know, he, he missed all the offseason program before 
you know, being put in as the as a starting left tackle. So I think this is going to be an uh, important offseason for him. Um, and, and I think being able to start on a clean slate with a, with a lot of new eyes on you, uh, I think will be beneficial for him. Yeah, and so there's another one where it's like he's being honest there. And I don't even know if he intended to be as honest as he was, but so you're talking about a clean slate for a guy. Yeah. So who does he have a clean slate with? The new offensive line coach. Yeah. So I, <laughs> you know, I, that, this is something that I wondered about throughout the season. And, and I think you're, you're kind of getting indications now of like, I don't think Doug Marone liked Trevor very much at all. You know, I don't, I don't think that they worked well together. I just don't think that that, that, that syst program you know, that, that development plan, whatever was working. And I think that the coaching staff was aware of that. Um, and so hopefully, yeah, hopefully that's what you, you know, if you're trying to look at the, the, the bright side of like, how can we still hope for Trevor Penning to, to return some of that investment as a first round pick, it's that it just was not working last year. Um, he didn't have a right. training camp. It just didn't, the development wasn't there. You got benched. Hope, so hopefully he can come back this off season, do the work he needs to do, have a coach that maybe understands him a little better and can get more out of him. That's what the hope is. And that's what I think the team is hoping for. Um, but yeah, I did think that, you know, the clean slate thing was interesting. Yeah, that definitely stood out to me too. And yeah. right away went to, all right, new coach, fresh slate, right? Like you said. Yeah. Uh, so, and hopefully that's true. Hopefully that is what happens. Um, sure if not, Man, that's going to look like a real bad pick, and it already does, but it's going to look even worse because <laughs> right now yeah. he's two years in. He's still got two years on that rookie deal. If you can get a productive player over the next two years, you'll start to look at that pick a, a little differently, but it's got to happen. So we'll see. But yeah, I agree that this is a huge offseason for him. We got to worry about one tackle with a knee issue, and then the other tackle has f feet issues. Well, yeah, that's why if Ryan's if Ryan's knee issue is much is less of a concern than that, then I I can handle the right side or the left side of the line. Right. Yeah, but all right, let's wrap up this segment. We're gonna come back. We're gonna talk more about what Jeff Ireland said, more combine related stuff, and then we'll get out of your hair. But for now, this is Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He is Steve Geller. We'll be right back. And we're back on Inside Black and Gold. I'm Jeff Nowak. He is Steve Geller. One final segment here. We're going to go through a bit more from the combine, a bit more from what Jeff Ireland said. And, you know, this is the second time we've heard from Jeff Ireland in like the last, what, two weeks, right? Um, but before we get into that, I want to talk about what DA said about Clint Kubiak. And not the, you know, we've heard from DA on Clint before, but to bridge kind of into the conversation, I want to talk about this because this is what he had to say when he was asked, you know, what players are Clint Kubiak excited to work with? And this is what DA had to say. I, I think, you know, the interesting thing is, is when a new group comes in, um, you know, they, they, they kind of look at your team and, they, and they, they, they look at it from a, from a positive perspective. And so uh, the exciting thing was, you know, I think the offensive staff as a whole was, was really excited about working with a lot of the pieces uh, to the puzzle that we have on offense. And so, um, look, I think that's, I think that brings an excitement to, to me in terms of what I think we can do offensively. Yeah. And so I think what he's saying there is, you know, the, the offense that's coming in, the offensive system that's coming in, they like the pieces, right? So There's a lot to we, like, <laughs> yeah. And there, there are pieces to like, but it's a question of how much needs to change to suit what you want to do on offense. And, while I, that is going to happen, you're going to have to make changes. You're going to do some stuff. I do think that in large part, the one of the selling points for the staffers that you're bringing in was it's like, yeah, we can make it work with this guy. We can make it work with this guy. We really like what we can do here. You know, like I think that's important as you're putting this puzzle together to know that the coaching staff that you're bringing in likes the pieces that it's looking at. And I think, you know, that's that's significant because you're going to get into free agency. You're going to get into the draft. And you're going to figure out where, what are our musts, needs, and wants. And if there's a lot of needs up there, then that's going to have to inform your decisions. If it's more, yeah, we want to get a little better at this. We want to find someone who's a little better at this. You can do that in one offseason. But if there's a ton of needs, that's hard to deal with in one offseason. That means that makes it more of a two, three-year project. And I don't think a two, three-year project is going to fly. 
with to me with the offense at least the the biggest key is really not the weapons but obviously the offensive line which is a, a, a huge key to a success of the offense you just need to protect car more and get the run game going I agree. And I think the offensive line is the biggest question I have in terms of, can you block the way you need to block? Do you have yeah. the, the, the athletes that you need? And that's going to be an interesting question. And a guy like Cesar Ruiz, I think is intriguing because I think he can do a lot more than he has been doing. Um, he's very athletic. I think if people underestimate how athletic Cesar Ruiz is, he's got their boxing. Um, so we'll see, but so, you know, then the next step, okay, you're at the combine, you know, the saints are a little old school in how they operate. A lot of teams, aren't valuing the combine as high as they used to for one thing. Thing. Well, it is, but it's also like you have all of these data points. You have all of this tape. You have all this advanced tracking. How much are you really gaining from watching guys running around in shorts and doing these drills? You know, it like, that's why the, the, the senior bowl, I think has slowly become more valuable than the combine because in place of all these, you know, weird drills that don't actually count for football. <laughs> You're doing one-on-one stuff. You're actually doing competitive work. And and I'm not even talking about the game. I'm talking about practice. Because, like, I want to see Olu Fashanu go against Tyler Guyton, right? I want to see right. these, you know, guys who – I want to see how they stack up in the – you know, it, and you don't really get that at the combine. And so it's like just – you know, it's like, oh, he ran a really fast 40, but – when are you going to see this guy run with a full sprint down the field? And when is that even practical? Like, it's just, you're getting these data points and you're getting it, but you kind of have that already. Like you can track how fast Jaden Daniels is running on the field. You don't need to see him run a 40 to know he's going to run a fast 40. So I don't know. It's, it's kind of strange, but again, the interview process is invaluable. So right. one way or another, you're, the saints are never going to stop doing it. Um, and I do think the Saints are one of the old school teams that does take a little value in these measurables. And one of the questions that was asked to uh, Jeff Ireland was, uh, you know, what do you think about these teams or these players opting out of workouts? And, and how does that affect your process? And I thought he gave a pretty honest answer here. High profile, like cases of guys not participating in the drills this year. I know it's maybe been like that for the last couple of years, but... Is that a trend you see kind of going? Is that something that's harder to evaluate? How do you kind of see that? As- it's tough. You know, it's tough. You know, look, at, I feel like the player's job is to answer all of our questions. Uh, my job is to try to build conviction to draft the player. And so when a player doesn't interview or doesn't do a medical or doesn't do a workout, those are questions that we have. And when I got questions on a player that doesn't do this, that, or the other, then I'm probably going to pass on that player and go with the player that has answered all those questions because I got conviction. You know, it's no different than any of you guys making decision. You're going to make decision based on as, as educated and as convicted as you can on the information that you have. And so when a player doesn't work out, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I feel like it hurts our ability to build that strong conviction to make a really sound decision. And uh, so, um, I'm, I'm usually chasing that information until last weekend we can get out. Um, and hopefully, you know, the, hopefully that's not a trend. Um, but it seems to be quite frequent uh, that we do it. And, and at, at the end of the day, most of the time we get, them, we, get them to do the, we get them to do the drill. It's just sometimes not on their, it's on their time frame, not on ours. Yeah, and, and so, like, if you're wondering, you know, at least for the Saints – this is impacting the process for them. Like their job is to get as much information as possible so that when you're deciding between one player and another, you are not guessing. You are not wondering what this data point would be if you had it. And I think the Saints very much would would pass on a prospect because they didn't get the information they need. Like they're not going to be out there guessing. They believe in their process and they're going to go with it. So like, I think that he, he, he is annoyed when players skip these these workouts, right? Because there's only so much time that you have to collect all this information and they don't do it. They don't do an interview. They don't do this. That might that might be the difference between the Saints drafting a guy and the Saints not drafting a guy. Yeah, t- to me, you know, you t- touched on it. Like, obviously, what they're going to put on film at the Combine is much different than what they've already done in college. That interview process is so vital and... Uh, just curious, like, you know, if 
you know, these guys that aren't taking part in the drills, they still are available for, for interviews at least. Yeah, uh, as far as I know, although he did mention that, like, you know, what if they don't do an interview? So I don't know if maybe there are guys who are out there skipping interviews. Uh, and, you know, that seems ridiculous to me if you're a player. Well, it is, you know, but what if you don't want to get drafted by a certain team? You know, what What if you just don't want to go there? You know, is, is that a way that you can impact the process in a way? Absolutely in, in, right. Yeah, you know, it's like, no, it I'm is. not going to talk to them. Maybe that is part of the calculation. It's like, I don't really want to play there anyway. So if they don't draft me, who cares? I'm not going to go talk to them. And, you know, uh, you know, so who knows? But at the end of the day, if you're a good enough player, you're going to get drafted by someone, you know, and they're going to figure out this information in the mid. It's more like second, third round guys that I think get impacted. I think in the top end, you're not seeing guys skip interviews or whatever. And and they're going to have their pro day and you're going to go watch and you're going to get the information. And again, like you said, it's on their time. But no, I, I, it does impact the process. And uh, and scouting is imperfect to begin with, you know, so so you got to go from there and. You know, the, the, another question that I know people uh, have asked is, so why did the Saints interview Jaden Daniels? You know, <laughs> how is it, what is the value in taking time, the, that valuable scouting time and sitting down with a guy who's almost certainly not going to be on the board when you pick? And so you have a quite, okay, maybe they're considering a major trade. Maybe, maybe they know something. Maybe they're like, oh, we're going to go get this guy or, or whatever. Um, and, and Jeff was asked about that, so let's hear what he had to say. Um, look, the draft's an inexact science, and um, you can't say he'll be gone. You know, you, you never know. Um, we have to be prepared for, for everything. I've been in drafts where players have slipped. I don't think he's going to, uh, but I've been in drafts where maybe we've taken the um, things for granted that he's going to be gone, and you get to it, and he's still sitting there for us and maybe our scouting staff didn't do our homework at that time on that player and uh, that's a dangerous game to play so we're going to do our homework on every single player um, and uh, that was the case with Jaden. and uh, it, we had a great interview with him he's a great kid uh, very impressed with him is there a world in which to maybe not Jaden Daniels specifically but you know some of these guys that you, you meet with four or five years down the road when they come off their rookie contract they become available that information is helpful I imagine Exactly. We call it a historical document. You know, it's uh, it's there until until the guy retires. And we look back on that document from uh, from today or tomorrow, whenever we've, we've accumulated all that uh, data. And um, and we'll use it in free agency, whether it's a free agent, whether he's on the street uh, as a street free agent. Um, you know, whatever case, we, we look back in these documents and because uh, we don't really call around to teams during free agency because you don't know if they want to keep them, you know, so we have to look back at this and and, uh, you know, <clears throat> players mature over time. And so you have to take that with a you know, grain of salt at sometimes. But, uh, yeah, it's a historical document. And we look back on it quite frequently. Just like the Galaxy Quest missions, you know, the historical documents. I don't know if anyone gets that reference with me. Um, but yeah, so you have them. And, and, and so, you know, you're not going to, he's not going to tell you, Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. But I do think that his answer does offer a hint that talking to Jaden is not necessarily an indicator that the saints are like, Oh, we're going to go trade up. We're going to, we're going to sell the farm and go get this guy at number three. It is, it is more about due diligence than anything else. And, and I think that's a smart thing to do because, like, you're not talking about even, okay, yeah, maybe he's not there at 14, but what if he slips to nine? What right. if he slips to 10 in a range where maybe you could swing a trade? Like, no, they're not going to – I don't see a scenario where the Saints have the firepower or even should use the firepower to go up to number three. But you can't just sit there and say there's no way. You know, maybe maybe something comes out in his medicals that people that scare people off. Maybe no one went to his birthday party and you don't – you don't want to mess with that. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, I think that's what it's about. And like, I, I only bring this up because I, I get all these alerts, these like uh, Google alerts for all these like, you know, sketchy sources with bad headlines. And it's like, oh, the Saints are getting ready to make a blockbuster trade. It's not really what's happening. Don't use this. Don't use a interview at the Combine as an indicator that they're going to make a huge trade. Right. But they do want to have that information. Right. And we've seen this in the past, too. It's like uh, and I think it was Ross Jackson asked the question. Yeah. Well, these guys, maybe they're a free agent in three, four years and and you don't or four or five years, I should say. And you don't necessarily want, want to trust the analysis of 
other teams that might not, you know, they're not on your side. <laughs> why, why would another team give you Intel? Um, so you need to do it yourself. And this is an opportunity to do that. So that's, that's why they talked to Jaden. Um, I fully expect him to go at three, but yeah. Also, uh, what happens if the Falcons do make this crazy trade up the board and end up selecting Jaden Daniels? You got a little inside on an opponent you're going to face twice a year. Yeah, right. Exactly. No, it, it, and it makes sense to do. And I just think it's funny because, you know, it's going to hit dry headline. Uh, I don't, as, soon as, as soon as that did pop up on the social media everywhere, I knew too, uh, between LSU and Saints fans, folks are going crazy in Louisiana over it. For sure. And, and, uh, and yeah, and that's going to be the case. They're going to meet with dozens and dozens of players, right? It's you just, again, it's about getting that information. Um, I have one more clip from Jeff that I want to play just because I thought it was interesting. And it, and I, I don't know if I said this, Jeff, Jeff Ireland, he's the Saints scouting director. He's also the assistant GM. So he's got some insight in this process. <laughs> um, but here, this is uh, about the scouting. At all, has your process kind of evolved over that time? You try to get better every year. You try to learn from the draft. You know, there's trends. There's different things that change. Um, you know, we're constantly updating our proto prototypes. We're constantly updating our thresholds. We're, we're trying to understand where you find players, where you, where you can get inexpensive players in terms of resources uh, to the draft, you know, and free agency. Um, but the process of cutting down the board and the, the makeup that we're looking for, the you know the the demeanor and the toughness all those things you know they stay the same for the most part you just keep, have to keep learning because the game's changing we can only really we have to change along with college because college is giving us our our farm network and so if they're not giving us fullbacks they're not giving us wide tight ends and they're not giving us you know you know three down running backs we have to change with that and we have um they're giving us more athletic quarterbacks we have to change with that we're getting less pocket passers so we have to change you know our mindset and how we utilize those players and so that's how i've evolved at least at least i've tried to evolve yeah yeah and so you know i i think that's interesting because you know in other sports you have a farm system and basically you have a farm system where you know you can dictate the type of players you're you're developing and how and how you're setting things up in basketball it's like there's not really that much variation in terms of what you're doing you're seven feet tall you're a center right you're you're six two and you can dribble you're a guard right uh whereas in football you know you really don't have much impact on the process at the nfl level but that's where you're getting all your players is is from the college system and so if you're not getting like, like you said you're not getting fullbacks you're not getting in line tight ends so what do you do as an NFL team? Are you stubborn and sticks like, oh, no, this is what we do. We're going to go find someone who's never done this before and do what we want to do, even though it might not be what they do best, right? And so you, there's that kind of uh, give and take. And you, again, have no input on the college system because there's no links between the college teams and the pro teams. You don't get to do that. There's no G League team that you can send a guy to and develop in a certain way. You know, there's the the... the careers of these guys are so short that you know you it's it's a it's a risk to take a guy who you think can do something that has never done it you know and and it's i just think it's interesting and i as a scouting director i, I don't envy that because that's got to be tough is to you're just you're projecting so much and you don't have much say in it um and it's like oh well, you want a dual threat quarterback like that's good because there's that's all there is now you know, you don't have these pocket passers that coming out of the league. Some some of them, yeah, you can do that better than others. But a lot of these guys, you just have to mold your offense around them and figure out, are they good enough at doing what they do for you to change your system to adapt? So, I don't know. I, I just I, It was something I hadn't really thought about until he said that, but I, I do think it's a good point. It's like you would love to be like, oh, this is what we do. This is our system. This is how we operate. But what if the players that you need to run that system are not getting developed in college? Yeah, what's interesting too, like you, you mentioned the the Saints prototype, it seemed at defensive end. I think that's even changing. Well, it has again, like like, well, again, has like what he's saying, it has to change because the guys you want to draft don't exist. <laughs> you don't have these big 280 pound rushers coming out of college. You have like Nolan Smith, you know, you have these small guys who, you know, can maybe profile to get a little bigger, but that's not what, you know, I think, uh, uh, Dallas Turner, he's talking about, he's like, I, I played at 260 and then, but I decided that I needed to to get slimmer to, to be better, you know? And 
And it's like, well, that's not a, if I'm the saints, I'm like, I want a bigger guy. You know, it, right. It's kind of interesting. And, you know, I think the saints are a little more stubborn than most when it comes to their, their prototypes and, and the type of players they look for. But, you know, maybe, maybe this is where you kind of have to make those adjustments and, and you have to figure it out because again, where are you getting your players? You know, uh, there isn't just this pool of, of, of different types of, of programs in this. It's like, oh, we want to draft out of this. Well, what if the best players aren't there, right? You want to take the best players, but the best players that do certain things. Um, so it, it is, this, this whole time of year is so fascinating and, and there's really no way to know who's doing it right and who's not. You kind of just have to trust it. You know, missing on picks is, is often a lot more about what's between their ears than anything else. And you got to figure it out. But I do think Jeff Ireland, you know, he's been, he's been on that job for about nine years. He's, I think he's done a very good job. And, you know, you'll hear the gripes about the misses and you're always, every team has misses, you know, like we want to talk about how well the Eagles have drafted the team that, that took Jalen Rager or a pick before Justin Jefferson, right? Like every team screws up. It's just a matter of, of how many times you hit, what's your hit rate. And I think the saints have had a pretty good hit rate overall. They've just missed on the big guys, and that's really impacted them. Yeah, the, those early picks, like we you know, talked a little about earlier with the defensive end and the offensive line, uh, it's definitely hurt the team. And you talk about uh, the, the, the ability to develop players. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it has been injury issues, too. <laughs> Yeah, and and yeah, and I do wonder. Okay, so how how if you weren't as stubborn about your prototypes and metrics, would you have maybe passed on a couple of these guys? Would you have been so all in on Marcus Davenport <laughs> if you were willing to be a little bit more, um, you know, versatile with some of these prototypes? I don't know. I don't know. It, it, there's no way to know. <laughs> but I do think that that's as you go forward. You know, I think that is one way to to mitigate some of these mistakes is by playing, you know, you know, looking at the board and playing the board as opposed to s- trying to set the board, how you want it to be like you there's, you just can't always do that. Um, and you find, you find talented players and you make them fit. You, you don't try to find a player that fits you and, and say, ah, oh, they're not, they're not the best player, but they're, they, it'll be easier for us to make it work within what we want to do. I don't think that's the right approach. And I hope the saints over the next few years kind of come to terms with that in ways that they may have not in the past. And we'll see, but I think like, like, yeah, no, um, I kind of lost my train of thought there, but that's really all I got. You know, I, we've, we've thrown a lot of sound at you here and I think that was the right call because I'm not there. So (laughs) we're hearing from people that are there. (laughs) <laughs> that that uh, that have that. Um, I hope I hope that's this information has been helpful. Well, that I mean, the drills are just cranking up. I know we had some guys talking at the podium, uh, but uh, I always find it interesting. For some reason, the Saints coaching staff or uh, front office, nobody wants to take the podium at the combine. The Saints were like in a hallway somewhere at the at the hotel. It looked like. Yeah, I don't think they talked last year at all. So this is <laughs> this is a concession. Uh, and and like what's surprising, Peyton never did, and he was at the podium for Denver. So I'm like, what's going on? Yeah, I I, uh, I, I wonder if you know, there's a lot of a lot of uh, pressure from the Denver media probably to get up there and and do that. I do, I do think part of it is like the size of the media contingent, right? Like if you have 40 people and like 17 cameras, it's probably a little more difficult to to set up in a corner of a hallway somewhere, you know, between like eight people. Right. I got you. Yeah. Like I think they, you know, the saints media contingent, well, we do a pretty good contingent. It's not, it's definitely not the biggest. Let's put it that way. No, but and, it is uh, consistent. Right. But uh, like I said, to me, it's just odd that for whatever reason, the saints hate going to the podium at the combine. No, no, they talk to well, you know, I, I don't mind it as long as they give extensive interviews. Like, yeah, right. Both DA and Jeff talked for 16 minutes, which is like, that's a, that's a good length interview. If they were like five minutes and they, they and they were like, I gotta get out of here. Then that would be kind of lame. And like so, you had mentioned briefly, the, it was surprising to me. We heard from Ireland cause we just got him at the, uh, the senior bowl. This is his time to shine, man. Right. We'll go entire year the entire year without talking to Jeff. And then we'll talk to him like four times within a month. I'm glad he's still around. Yeah, I like Jeff. Jeff's a good guy. Got a good name. Good name, good country. Good stuff. He, 
he um uh, when I was traveling with the team doing sideline stuff, there was one instance where I had my bag and was bringing other broadcast equipment with me with me, and I was struggling. All of a sudden, from behind, someone takes one of the bags and is like, "I got it for you." I turn around, he's like, "Oh, Jeff Ireland." I'm like, "I know who you are." I couldn't believe that this guy is helping me out with my bags and definitely appreciated it. That was nice. Yeah, yeah exactly. Was I, was like, I, right. I, text, I texted you about this. I had a connecting flight uh, to <laughs> yeah. get here and uh, I was getting off the plane and, and I saw these two guys walking toward me. I was like, oh, these guys look so familiar. And I'm like, oh, it's Darren Rizzi and Jeff Ireland. They were just on the same plane. I'm sure they were getting a connecting flight to, to get to uh, um, Indy. Right. right. Um, <laughs> I was not. I was coming here, but it was just kind of funny because I was just like, oh, look at that. Oh, look at what it is. Um, maybe they were, maybe they're there to hang out with like another Georgia State kicker. Hmm. <laughs> but we'll find out. <laughs> Either way, that's it. That's all I got. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm going to hang out here for a few more days and then schlep <laughs> my way back up to, to New Orleans. Hopefully, it's a little warmer than it was when I left because it was cold when I left. It kind of warmed up, and we got a little bit of a cold front right now, a little windy today, but overall, it's been gorgeous for sure. Yeah. All right. I, I'm looking forward to it. I miss my dog. Um, but, yeah, thanks, everyone, for listening. I'm Jeff Nowak. He's Steve Geller. You can follow me on Twitter at Jeff underscore Nowak. You can follow him at Steve Geller, WWL. You can follow the show at Saints underscore pod. Make sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hit us up on YouTube. Ring the bell at WWL Sports. Check out WWL dot com for the latest news notes and analysis like i said at the beginning we're going to do a full episode on the grades ideally on monday unless there's breaking news that forces us to push that back later in the week but i want to get through i want to go through a lot of the grades not just the saints grade we want to see how the saints kind of stack up yeah and some of the real bad teams uh, that's that's always the most fun part is to go through the teams that got real bad grades and find out why um so that's going to be probably our next episode but as always if you want if you want us to talk about anything if you have any suggestions uh, dms are open you can shoot emails whatever but thanks everyone for listening who dat go saints free agency's coming <laughs> sure is peace y'all easy <laughs>